sir. All right. So one of my favorite things to do as an OSINT practitioner is to research things that are happening in real life. Um, it's wonderful practice. Um, so I'll start things off with a personal story um, to, to kick things off. Uh, I was traveling back from a SANS event in March last year, and I had a layover in Atlanta Airport on the way home to my home in South Carolina. Um, so I called my wife and children to say goodnight, because I'm probably going to catch them uh, after they go to bed. And my wife answers the phone. She's like, hey, I'm glad you called. Me and the kids are sheltered in the hallway downstairs. Um, we got the alert on our phones that there's a tornado warning, take shelter immediately. She's like, I'm, phone's a little bit low battery, so I'm not gonna stay on the phone with you, but I'll text you what's going on. <clears throat> and I said, okay, uh, love you guys, let me know. We hung up, <clears throat> I said a swear word pretty loud in the airport, and immediately pulled out my laptop and some earbuds for my phone. On my phone, I went to Broadcastify, which is an internet radio repeater um, that'll pull emergency uh, radio, uh, fire dispatch, EMS, public safety frequencies um, on, the, on the website. I went to our county and started listening to the feeds. On my laptop, I pulled out Google Maps, <clears throat> and I just started listening to what I was hearing across the radio. Um, I heard a couple dispatch uh, locations pop out that sounded like uh, streets I was familiar with. Um, so I pulled it up. Uh, one was Community Drive and Platte Springs Road, um, which I mapped, which was about a 10 minute drive from my house. Uh, unfortunately, it was in that same exact trajectory that the N NWS site was showing that the tornado was heading. <clears throat> so I didn't feel great about that. I kept listening. Um, about five minutes later, I think it was, there was a report of downed power lines. Um, they had gone to that location, which ended up being a little bit uh, further over, another 10 minutes or so from uh, the first location, and I heard the dispatch give the location, plot it on the map, and then listen. They got there, um, said that there was reports of the funnel cloud, but you know, no, no existing, uh, no existing storm signs at the moment. And I was able to plot the home address and realize that it, you know, was going at a trajectory away from our house at this point. Text the text the wife and kids back home, and they, they said, yeah, it actually seems like it's, it's calming down out there. So, you know, that, that sense of uh, urgency there is, is one of those things that'll drive you. Um, I'm gonna take a step back and, and tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I consider myself very fortunate for the last uh, five years or so. I've been doing OSINT as my main, uh, main role uh, with the companies that I'm at. I'm currently with, uh, with a bank, uh, essentially using OSINT to track down cyber criminals. Anybody that's enacting fraud against uh, our bank or our customers, um, I get to dig with OSINT to find them. Before that, I was doing digital forensics for a private investigation company. And when I wasn't digging into electronics in the lab, I could talk to the uh, PIs and help them track down people in the cases uh, that they were trying to find if they had dead ends um, using OSINT as well. I'm part of the advisory board for the OSINT Curious Project, uh, which you'll, you'll hear more about here shortly. Uh, and I blog a lot of my research on uh, learnallthethings.net. Um, I try not to take myself too seriously, though. I'm just a guy that likes to do OSINT research. Um, I do have another real-time talk I did uh, a couple years ago. In this talk, there was two escaped uh, fugitives. Um, the story itself is, is pretty tragic, um, but it reads out like a, a Hollywood action movie. Um, two convicts broke out of a prison bus in a uh, city just outside of Atlanta, Georgia, um, killed two corrections officers, carjacked a nearby car, and went on a three-day uh, spree. Um, they ended up being apprehended in rural Tennessee three days later. But that story, as, it, as I researched that one in real time, was <clears throat> a great example of why real-time OSINT is good practice uh, for our research skills. Um, over the three days, the trail was white hot. There was police helicopters in the air. Um, and then at night, the, the escapees were laying low. So it turned into a cold case where people were kind of waiting for, you know, what's the next move going to be? <clears throat> when I got done with that talk, the very first uh, Q&A hand that went up said, yes, uh, why do you do this? And I was like, well, in my head, 
because OSINT's awesome and I love it. Um, but I started to think it out as, as it went along, and that sense of urgency um, that we talk about, um, the, the tornado warning story at the beginning there, it drives you to, to research quickly. It kind of keeps you on your toes um, as you're doing these things. Uh, the direction that you take uh, to find this information is a little bit different when it's a real-time scenario. Um, this morning, Chris talked about um, using a, a similar methodology across Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram. <clears throat> it was repeatable, um, it was effective, um, and it was something that you kind of would follow in a routine. With real-time events, you kind of jump around a little bit and go outside of your normal research. In essence, it just kind of makes you a better investigator. That practice mode of kind of shifting gears is one of those things that, that helps you learn a new way to do something, and a lot of times it ends up being a new tactic that you can share with other people. <clears throat> this is my ethics slide. Um, Real-time events typically involve some type of tragedy. Um, the fugitives that, that escaped, you know, they, they killed some people. Um, so you want to be respectful. Um, I, don't, I don't recommend tweeting out your research real time. Um, law enforcement may be involved. It's potentially you could impede an investigation. Um, I saw this in 2017 when there was an explosion in Manchester, England, outside of an Ariana Grande concert. Somebody was digesting all the early reports that were coming in, and they were going out there and, and really kind of putting it out there that it just kind of sounded like a pyrotechnics error in the show. Um, it got a lot of traction, but that wasn't the case. It was a suicide bomber. There was 22 deaths in that situation, and um, the person took a lot of heat online for putting that research out there in that, that manner. So while I love to bounce ideas back and forth between my OSINT researcher friends, um, do it in a closed environment it would be my recommendation, um, because a lot of times they'll give you some great ideas, but you don't want to be really be putting it out there. Um, and also, uh, use OPSEC. Operational security, um, I think, as most OSINT practitioners know, don't use your personal accounts, um, especially if you're looking up fugitives. The last thing you want to do is like for your uh, Aunt Kathy in your personal network to be connected to the Georgia fugitives the next time you log in <clears throat> because you didn't use the, the right account uh, doing your research. <clears throat> like I said, with the, the research, it, it kind of makes you shift gears depending on what's going on. With the event, if we're catching up to the story, we use a different type of tactic and, and probably tools in, than we do if we are ahead or kind of with the, the story as it's happening. <clears throat> if you're catching up to the story, typically you can kind of use the, the standard OSINT methodology. Things have already happened, so the data that's out there exists on sites that you can probably go and research, get a lead, um, take what you know, put your goals of what you're trying to find, and kind of run your typical routines. Um, if you're catching up to the story, it's, it's kind of normal OSINT day-to-day. Uh, -day. If you get ahead of the story, your posture changes a little bit, because what you're doing is kind of predicting something that might be about to happen, um, so you kind of look at it a slightly different way. You know, Once we're doing that, we're going to want to find out where this information is going to come from, if a certain reporter is, is tuned into the story, you might be watching their account specifically. Um, so the, the things kind of change as we take this route. <clears throat> I want you to stay on the cutting edge of a breaking story. Sorry, pun intended. Um, so I'll share a couple of, of different stories that I covered and, and a random uh, uh, tip or technique that kind of popped out from that research. Um, this picture itself has just a little funny story. Uh, anybody familiar with the show Dexter? If you're not, he was a serial killer that killed other killers, uh, in short. <clears throat> when I was making this slide, I knew I just wanted to find a picture of his, his knife kill kit. Um, so I went looking, expecting to find like a Dexter fan site. <clears throat> what I found was an Etsy page where somebody was selling custom cutlery kits um, to hold all of your sharp tools. Not uh, <clears throat> Some scary people out there, and, and they're on Etsy. <laughs> all right. Uh, the first uh, tool I'll share shouldn't be a big surprise. It's Google Maps, but it's not exactly the, the way you think you might use it. Um, what we had was another uh, start of a manhunt. A reporter gave a uh, county location, but not the actual street address. 
So I was trying to figure out where this was happening. It, the, the post was like 30 minutes ago when I first came across it. There was a partially visible sign that was cut off in the, uh, the photo. Um, so I, I kind of drilled into the area, but what you can do is ask Google Maps for directions through the area. A lot of times if there's congestion, like a lot of p police presence, you know, we're gonna have the uh, spot that we can maybe dig into. Um, you don't have to do it as a directions either. If you hit the uh, menu bar up at the top, you can actually just go and turn on the traffic filter, and a lot of times you'll see different parts of a, a known city or county kind of read out, and you might want to look around those areas. After that, it's kind of your standard validation. You can see the picture on uh, Twitter. Uh, there is, in the street maps view, even though it was kind of a you know, woody area there, there was branch formations, um, the for sale sign, and uh, the the partially visible street sign were all there to validate the location. Um, different current event, this was just from last month. Um, while I was teaching Sec 47 with uh, Micah, uh, stories started trending about an explosion uh, outside of Houston, Texas. Um, somebody's wise doorbell camera actually caught the explosion and a lot of people were starting to, to put mutterings online on different social media about what was going on. <clears throat> A lot of times when media gets involved with a breaking story like that, they'll give you this uh, block format address. The 4500 block of Gessner is where they were leading us. Um, same kind of thing with, uh, with other things. You know, There's a shooting at the 500 block of Main Street. They don't tell you exactly where it's happening, but you get that, that little snippet of the block. For those, I like the map site wego.here.com. You can type in that block format address that they gave you, and it'll kind of drop that pin in general where that is. But if you zoom into that map, <clears throat> you can actually see the layout of the block system in that area. So you know that it might not be at that point, but you can kind of see the, the shape of the block and, and where that 4300 could possibly lie. Um, so that comes in handy if you're, if you're trying to drill into an address. If you don't have a street, oh snap, maps.snapchat.com, uh, the heat map will help you out. Here we can just kind of see that an area outside of Houston had a whole bunch of activity. Um, people that post uh, videos publicly on Snapchat, those stay on the map for 24 hours and the, the map site just kind of gives you a heat map of really high level activity and you can pretty much see where something might be happening. As you click through those, you'll get videos. Um, definitely was police presence at the time when this was going on and there was actually footage inside people's homes uh, where this explosion had occurred. Uh, what it turned out, it was a uh, chemical plant um, that had some kind of an accident and exploded, um, damaged a bunch of houses in the area, and uh, ended up killing two people as a result. Um, Snapchat Maps is awesome for finding that information when you don't have the street address. Um, I talk about alternatives here. Um, this one has a big asterisk because Facebook Live Actually, in June of 2019, if you're familiar with doing Facebook OSINT, they nerfed a lot of the uh, uh, functionality, the graph search. Um, at the same time, the Facebook Live map went away because they used to have just a, a great map with dots and everything. Now it's kind of just a, a feed of breaking news and TV shows and entertainment stuff. <clears throat> Periscope, kind of the, the Twitter alternative, um, they had definite hits that were going on at the time. Um, and it's, it's not as widely used as Snapchat, but it's good to have. The reason to have choices is just different features and strengths. SnapMap, widely used. The public posts will be available for 24 hours, um, and then they kind of drop off. So if it's happened very recently, it's a great place to start. Periscope, not as widely used, but it's got some historic function because those will stay up for about 30 days. So if something is a little bit further out, um, might not be on the Snap Map anymore, but Periscope uh, would likely still have it for the last month or so. so. Like I said, Facebook Live, it's good to note it was really useful when it was there, so if it comes back, that's great, but you know, they got rid of it because privacy. Mark Zuckerberg is looking out for you. <laughs> no, he's not. <clears throat> um, this story in 2017, the Seminole Heights serial killer um, there was a series of shootings that started to happen in Seminole Heights, Florida, which is just outside of Tampa. And the first location, October 9th, uh, somebody was shot outside of a bus stop. 
Um, the second one, 10 days later, um, another bus stop, another one outside of a homeless shelter, um, and another one nearby that same area. Uh, spanned over two and a half months. As these were happening, the police started to give us these little uh, photo snippets that you can see on the side. What they were looking for was somebody that saw something in the suspects, like body language. Um, they weren't really giving us a whole lot of details to the location of, of where they were traveling to, so they kept censoring the, the footage just to try to get somebody that, hey, do you, do you see this person? Do you recognize who that person might be? Not a whole lot of other details. Obviously, it's an active investigation with uh, peril for the people in the community, so they maybe didn't want to give out the locations of who gave them the footage either. Um, but as it started to progress, I think after the third shooting, they started to finally open up a little bit. <clears throat> One of the things that they pushed was a piece of footage that actually showed the suspect walking in one direction through a neighborhood. Uh, the feed actually pans and changes, and you can see them go past a certain house, and then a short while later, they snip it, and you can see that person flying back the other direction. Um, as you can imagine, um, he was doing the crime and then retreating the other direction. So it gave us something to actually work with there. Um, to find that location. The IPVM site um, is actually designed to help you cover an area with surveillance, uh, locate blind spots. Um, they've actually got a, a, a function that lets you show what different camera functions will show you in the view, and it's a cool embedded interactive map. It's really tied to uh, Google Maps Street View, so you'll have the overhead there where you can drop a camera, and then the, the breakout sign that'll show you what that camera's perspective is. When you drop that stuff in, we're able to kind of get into that same area where the shootings were happening and see that the output from IPVM site <clears throat> was showing exactly where the, the suspect was running by. As I was gathering the slides for this talk, the Google uh, streetcar had actually gone through again that neighborhood um, and done an update. When I thought it was really cool because one of the things I like to do when I find footage is to validate where it came from. Um, that same spot that I kind of dropped the camera on had two new uh, camera spots actually there. And you can see exactly where that footage came from, um, looking both directions, which was across the street from that footage there. Now, why was that important? Obviously, if we have the site of one of the killings and a direction pre and a direction post, you can tell that that middle cluster right there is definitely a place where somebody could maybe be hiding out, um, possibly a contact or a spot where a getaway vehicle was stored uh, before and, and after the, the shootings. <clears throat> I talked about Broadcastify at the beginning. Essentially what you're trying to do with all of these stories is put eyes and ears on a location. With Broadcastify, if you go to the, the website version, you actually just get a map. So if something's happening in a particular state that you want to get a, a view into, um, you can go ahead and find it. And it's not uncommon to hear the dispatchers talk about very specific pieces of information. Um, it was the Austin serial bombings that were occurring back in 2018. Somebody was mailing bombs around the city of uh, Austin, Texas. I was listening in during some of that uh, activity it was across the course of about 22 days, and you were literally hearing the dispatch call in um, suspicious package. People were afraid of Amazons that were showing up <clears throat> that they didn't order. So we could hear the emergency broadcasters uh, give an actual street address number, and then you could hear the, the police go out there. Um, I've heard VIN numbers, a uh, whole lot of uh, really detailed information if you happen to be listening at the same time. <clears throat> but as you can imagine, those results vary by region. Um, if you go on the website, there's usually uh, the top uh, listeners, which can tell you like kind of a hot spot of what's going on in the area. Chicago is definitely the hot spot most of the time, if nothing insane's going on somewhere else. Because of that, uh, somebody built this project site called crimeisdown.com. Um, they have a kind of an interactive map, and they're trying to automate some of the feeds that they're getting off of the, the Broadcastify site and a couple others. Um, including the, uh, the scanner guide, which you can get at the link there. Um, that guide is about a 30-page document that kind of outlines all the research that they've put into this 
It's a great grab because it's got some of the police jargon and the codes that you might hear when you're listening to these broadcasts. Um, it also has a link back to radioreference.com, which I'll get to here in a second, but it actually can give you uh, alternate ways to, to look up information. If you happen to be in an area that doesn't have uh, great coverage, um, there might be a, a way that you could tune in. The radio reference site itself, you can just access on your own. And that's the same deal. It's driven by a map. You can find out um, different, basically different federal and state level, uh, even like public uh, radio repeaters and ham radio stuff is in there. Um, but you might be able to find the actual frequency that some of the emergency uh, broadcasters are operating on. That becomes important <clears throat> if you're local enough because you can pick up the uh, cool item like an RTL SDR. Anybody have one of these? You do some really cool stuff with these. Um, you can get into like the, the ADBS exchange, which is uh, tracking airplanes that are in your area. Um, but one of the things you can really do is just use it as a, a tune-in radio. SDR Sharp is an open source uh, free program where you can essentially just look at the bandwidth frequency there and see spikes where it's typically radio channel Sometimes it's electronic noise interference in your house, which is actually cool to, to mess with too. Um, but you can tune into those radio frequencies by using the, the hardware with your computer to kind of listen into what's going on in your area in the airwaves. Um, I started with a personal story, so I'll finish with a personal story here. I was at my job at the, the private investigation firm, and one day doing forensics, I could see a whole bunch of police presence just kind of surround our block. We're like, hmm, that's not cool. Online with Twitter, there was reports of a suspicious package that was about a block and a half away. <clears throat> we weren't trapped in the block, so I wasn't super worried, but um, I had a flat tire that day, so I had actually left my car on the other side of all the police activity to get a new tire. Um, so I kind of was watching the, the radio um, nothing was really showing on Broadcastify, and then the idea popped in my head, well, let's plug in the RTL SDR. I checked radio reference, and I found a couple different frequencies that might have emergency uh, broadcasts on there, and I, I found one that was active, finally got it tuned in, and I heard the all clear, all clear, and all the vehicles just sprinted out of the area um, because it was a... Uh, public library on the corner where the homeless kind of would get forgetful with their backpacks. Um, so everything was clear. I could go get my car, and the police got the, uh, the fun of detonating um, homeless backpacks uh, with the bomb squad response team. So in conclusion, the, those type of stories are really fun to share. Like I said, they can be tragic, um, but they're a great way to practice your OSINT skills. Um, that sense of urgency it just kind of makes you work fast. You kind of think outside the box, um, and you find tools that help you stay out ahead of the story um, that you might not necessarily look into. What I like to do with all of my talks is I'll drop a link on my website that has um, all the tools and links to the stories. If you notice, I don't really put in uh, the names of the criminals and things like that. I did that with the original talk back at uh, B-Sides, and when they snapped it on, uh, on YouTube, it kind of memorialized the criminals. I don't really like that. So I'll give you the links to the stories if you want to see those ones that I talked about. <clears throat> but I like to keep the criminals' names and, and victims off of the slides. Uh, but those will be out there. I also like to talk to everybody after the um, conference during our networking times. If you have other uh, tactics and things where you've found success on that, please let me know, and if you're cool with me sharing them, I'd be glad to put them on the, uh, the link uh, when it goes out, so. All right, thank you, Josh. Nice job, man. Thank you. Yeah.